So in this module, we're going to take a look at using Simscape for modeling vibration problems. So this figure here shows the body of a vehicle which has a mass M1 uh, that is fitted to a wheel through a suspension, which is here marked as our C1. So there's a suspension there, C1, um, and has a spring over here that we can see as K1. Now the suspension C1 is fitted to a mass below marked M2. So there's our mass below M2, and this mass is fitted to a spring below marked our K2. So there's our spring below right there at K2. Now we can also see here that the wheel on the road is a positive slope. So there's our positive slope right there, uh, which has a height of Y. There's our height Y right there. Um, above the datum level. So we can see there's our datum level down here. So this is important when we're set, setting this up. This is, We have established a datum plane or a datum level for these problems. Now we can also see here that this mass M2 travels a distance X2 right there. There's our distance X2 that this M2 travels. And this is vertically above the mass M1 displays vertically for the distance X1 right there. Next, let's take a step back here and take a look at a little bit simpler model. So this will be a single mass model here. So in this single mass model, what we can see is we have this figure down below here. And in this figure, we see a body of mass M, uh, which is fitted to a suspension. Right here, we have our C and our spring constant K. Now, this suspension is fitted to a wheel whose contact point on the road is marked with a dot right here. So there's our contact point with the road with a dot right there. And what we can see is that the contact point is at a height uh, Y, and it's on the positive slope right here of the road. Now we can also see over here that this body right here is gonna move up a vertical distance from its original point position due to the wheel on the positive slope. So as this wheel right here moves up along this road here as a positive slope going up, then we can see that this distance X is gonna be moving up in this direction here. So next let's take a look at a mathematical model of this here. So since the static spring force is canceled by our gravity force, our mg here, we can obtain the following equation of motion, where we have our mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to our cy dot plus ky. Now for a specific example here, let's let our mass equal to 240 kilograms. Recall this is a one fourth car model, and we'll have our k is equal to 16,000 newtons per meter. Now we have the following relationship here in this equation. Our damping ratio can be defined by the following. The damping is equal to C divided by two square roots of MK. So let's just say that we need it uh, to have a damping ratio of 0.707. So if we need our damping ratio to be 0.707, we can calculate what our C value should be. So if we plug in our 0.707 for our damping ratio right here, and we have our M value of 240 that we plug in for our M, and we have our K of 16,000 that we plug in for our K right there, then our only unknown is this C value. We can back that out. When we do that, we find that C is equal to 2,743 Newton seconds per meter. So knowing that information, now that we have a C value, a damping ratio, we have an M and a K, we can go back up here, okay, there's an M, there's a C, and there's my K value right there, there's a K value right there, there's a C value right there. Plug these values in, and when I do that, I plug in my M of 240, so it's now 240X double dot, plus now we have a C value here that was 2,743 that we plug in, so that's times our X dot, plus now we have right here is our K value is given to us here, 16,000 times X. Now this is equal to our C value again, Again, plug that in there, 2,743 times Y dot, plus now the last one here is that K value again, which is 16,000 times our Y. So now this is our equation of motion with all of our known values plugged in. So now let's take a look at a test case here. So in this specific case, they're going to tell us that the car is going to go over a bump. And we're going to use this in order to solve the equation analytically. So let's just say that the vehicle goes across, hits a bump, and this bump is tell, they tell us that this bump is a half meter high, and it's approximately one meter in length. Um, and the speed that we're moving at here is about 40 miles per hour, and if we do the unit conversion here, 18 meters per second. Now they also give us some other crucial information here, and that's the uh, profile of the bump. So y of z is equal to 5.473 times ze to the negative fourth over here, where our z is going to be the horizontal distance. So this z value right here, y of z, 
is a horizontal distance traveled by the vehicle while going over the bump. Now we need to next relate the displacement y of t, which is felt by the suspension related to y of z. So how do we relate y of t to y of z through the vehicle speed uh, as follows the relationship here that z is equal to vt. So there's a relationship right now between our z and our t right there, where we have a given velocity here. Velocity is going to be 18 meters per second. And that's right in the problem statement right there, because it tells us that it's moving at 18 meters per second while it's going over the duration of the length approximately one meter of that bump. So we can go back to this equation, replace our z with this relationship with t here. So now we have this expression here with this relation to time, which is what we're used to dealing with here. So y of t, when we plug that value in for vt, where v is 18 meters per second, we end up with 97.858 te to the negative 72t. And where that 72 T comes in here, as we can see, this was a Z up here. So we still use that same relationship here, that Z is equal to VT, where V is 18. So we plug that in, that's where we get that negative 72 in our Y of T expression. From there, what we can do is take the first time derivative, now that we're dealing with this as a function of time, dy dt, which is the first time derivative of our y function right here. So we do all our simple calculus there. We end up with dy dt, or our first time derivative of y, is equal to negative 72 times 97.858 t e to the negative 72 plus 97.858 e to the negative 72 t. Now we can use a couple different methods in order to solve for this analytical solution uh, of these differential equations. You could use MATLAB, you could do it out by hand, you could use Python, Mathematica, even Excel can do some of these here. And we do that, we find that this is our x of t given by this relationship down here. So next, let's take a look at our bump response. So we can see our solution is given in this plot below here. And we see down on our x-axis, we have time in seconds. This is going from zero to a total of one second at the end here. And we're going in intervals of 0.1 seconds along the way. And on our y-axis over here, we have our displacement given to us in units of meters. We can see there's our zero, zero right there, our origin point. We can go up from there, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way up to 0.5 meters. And then below it, we go down in the same 0.1 meter intervals here, all the way down to a 0 0.5 meters for our displacement. Now we can see our plot here labeled x right here starts at our 0, 0. And as we go along here, it moves up. It reaches a maximum value right here at the peak of this guy, which if we come over to our y-axis gives us a 0.15 there. And we drop down here, and we're about, about a 0.7 or so down here. And then it slowly tapers off and levels off right around 0.4 or so, and it stays with the rest of the curves there. Now we can see next if we move on to our y-plot right here. We can see our y starts right about here, goes up to a maximum value of 0.5 at a uh, x-axis value of probably about 0.002, roughly there. Again, if we had this as an actual graph, we'd be able to pull this off of it if it was in MATLAB or Excel and look exactly where those peaks are. We could write a little script file to tell those are, but just eyeballing it off of that and interpolating here. We're about right there for our maximum value on our y-axis right here. Then that quickly tapers off, comes down here. So just about 1.12, it levels off and keeps straight right across along the way there. And last, we can see we have our stroke right here. Again, this starts right about 0 0.2 and drops down to about 0.45 right there at that same value on our x-axis of a 0 0.002 right about there. And then comes back up, reaches a max value right here uh, about 0 0.12, 0 0.13, tapers off, comes back down, and levels out as well. So what we can tell from this information that we interpret from the graph there, is it's going to show that the suspension has done a good job in reducing the effect of the bump on the passenger compartment displacement. And we can see that with all three of these graphs right there, as they all taper out and go back there within approximately 0.2 to 0.5 seconds. So with under half a second, it's done a great job of reducing the effect of that bump right there as far as our displacement goes. So what we can see here on this slide is our Simscape model. I'm going to go through over the next couple slides how we create this, what each individual element is, and how we can click and drag this within Simscape to create this entire model that we see here. So I'm going to individually number a couple of the key elements within this model here. So if we take a look at number one, number one is the clock um, on the left side, which is connected to our function y dot right here. Um, that's also marked as our f of u. 
So now this here then goes, we have number two element, which is our uh, Simulink PS mark SPS. So that's this element right here, which I've labeled two as well. And this has a horizontal arrow pointing to the right in our series right here. So then our next element I want to talk about here is our Y dot. So if we see this branches off right here, comes up and we have our Y dot right there, which connects back down through as well. If we look here right to our Simulink PS converter. And then we can see we're going to move on to our element four, which is our ideal translational velocity source right here. So this is number four. So the terminal to the right of our SPS right here, we can see this comes up like this right here and is connected to the terminal S of the ideal translational velocity source right there. So now we can move on to item number five right here, which is the terminal C. So if we come down here at the bottom, our terminal C right there at the bottom of the ideal translational velocity source, which we've labeled number four, this is going to be connected to what we're calling a me mechanical translation reference. So we can see that that comes right down here below to number five, our mechanical translational reference right there. And the last element in this portion of our diagram here that we're going to talk about, I've labeled number six. So between this mechanical translational re reference down here, number five, and our ideal translational velocity source up here, number four, a connection goes through to our solver configuration. So we can see in between these two, there's our connection that goes through over here down to number six, our solver configuration. And on the, uh, on the right marked uh, f of x right there is equal to zero. So we've also got our label within that for our item number six. So now I'm going to continue on and take a look at the next section of this diagram here. So I'm going to continue on with number seven. So the terminal P right here, you can see there's our terminal P right there, uh, at, the at the bottom right of our ideal translational motion sensor, which we've labeled seven right there, is connected to now this PS simulant converter marked PSS. So that's number eight right here with this guy there. Um, and again, this has the horizontal arrow pointing to the right right there that we can see. Now, from this here, the terminal uh, on the right of this PS simulant right here is marked X. So we can see that right there. It's connected to a block uh, marked X on the right. So this comes all the way across over here. And we can see this goes over to what we're calling number nine right there for this block there. Now, next, we're going to take a look at number 10 here. So between this uh, PS simulant converter, which is right here, level number eight, and our block marks X, which is labeled number nine right there, is a connection that goes down vertically and connects. So this goes down vertically right here and connects to the positive terminal of a small circle right there. So we'll label this small circle here number 10. Now, next, we can take a look at is number 11. So on the uh, far right side of our small circle right here, we can see a connection that goes through to the right to the stroke. And before the connection goes to the stroke connection, which we're going to call number 11 right here, it also drops right back down here to this horizontal plate that we've labeled 12. So we're going to move up to the top left of our diagram and take a look at that section of it now here. We can see on the top, we have the terminal marked R right here uh, from our translational, our ideal translational motion sensor right there. And this is connected to a spring marked K and a damper marked C that are in parallel at C. So we can see we come off of this ideal translational motion sensor right here. We follow this around and it goes over here. There's our spring marked K and our damper marked C that are going to be in parallel with each other. Now, the terminal R uh, from the spring marked K right here on the damper marked C is connected to a block marked M. So we can see these two guys right here come up together and they go to a block marked M, which I've labeled as 13 right there. Now, between this here and this here, we can see a connection that drops down and again goes in over here to terminal R uh, at our ideal translational motion sensor. Uh, inside of this translational motion sensor is a horizontal spring that is connected to the terminal R on the left side and terminal A on the right. So there's your terminal R right there and your terminal A over here on the right hand side there. So now on the top of this ideal translational motion sensor, we can see we have this terminal C right there, uh, which is going to be connected to a mechanical translational reference on our right. So this is number 14, our mechanical translational reference that's connected right here to terminal C. So as we continue on to the next section of our diagram here, we can see that below our ideal translational motion sensor, what we've labeled number seven right here, 
we see another clock. This clock is labeled clock one, which is connected to our function uh, of y right here, measures f of u right here, number 16. So here is our clock right here, I've labeled 15, clock number one. And this connects over here to our f of u function y right there. Now on the right side, of our f of u right here, our function y, we can see a connection y right here that goes to the right and is connected over here at 18 to a small circle at the negative terminal. Now we can also see that there's a connection that branches off <clears throat> right here from y and comes down here and connects to our block y down here at 17. So as we wrap up the description of this diagram, I'm going to bring the diagram back as a whole down here rather than individual sections. So you can see down here I have the diagram as a whole down here now as we can finish up the last couple little pieces of this as we're building our diagram. So number 12, we can see so before the connection goes to the right to the negative terminal of our small circle, a connection goes below, connects to a plate right there. So we can see that this goes down right here and connects to our plate right there at number 12. So that's right off of our small circle right there, drops down to number 12 and goes right to that plate right there. And a connection from the block mark X up here. So we can see here's our block marks X label number 19 right there, uh, <clears throat> goes down to the plate as well. So we can see right the connection right before we get to that there comes down and goes right here to number 12 to this uh, horizontal plate as well. Now we can see also there's a connection right here down at this bottom plate right here that is connected to the workspace uh, below that's going to be marked our sim, uh, sim out right there. So there's our workspace right there, sim out, labeled number 20. So now this figure shows a body of a vehicle that's fitted to a wheel through a suspension and a spring. And the wheel is on a road climbing a slope. So back to that sample problem there. So this is the diagram again as a whole. Now that we've gone through all the individual parts right there, the next thing that we're going to do is take a look at how we actually get these and how we put all the functions in and label these uh, for our entire diagram. So let's take a look at just one small section of that right there, our mass, damper, and spring uh, right here. So there is our M, our mass. Here's C as our damper. Here's K, our spring constant right there. Now, how do we place these? So let's start with building this model. How do we build this model? So if we go into Simscape, then into Foundations, Library, Mechanical, Translational Elements Library, and then from there we can select our mass, our translational damper and our translational spring blocks that were shown below here. So we can click and drag those once we have them or place them from those menu items right there, the drop downs, into this arrangement right here. So now for the second half of this, I'm going to go over the details for each of the items within our diagram here. And I'm just going to do this briefly in the video. I recommend you go back to the actual PDFs to go through this in detail for each of these steps along the way. So the first item here is the mass block here. And we pull this up. We can see we have the parameters shown here. So we have our mass that we can enter in here. So we're going to call this M here and we can drop down over here, select our units. And if there's initial velocity, we can put it in. In our case, it's zero. And again, make sure you uh, select the correct units there. Then the next thing that we're going to take a look at is our translational spring block. So again, this pops this up down here. This is our translational spring. Springs. This is going to represent the ideal mechanical behavior of a linear spring. So make sure we're dealing with a linear spring when we do this here. And we can come down here to our parameters for this one here. So we can see our spring rate, which is our K value here. And if there is any initial deformation, we can also answer that that end right here as well, which is really nice. But for our case here, this is zero. And again, make sure when you're looking over to the right, you select the right units for what you've done here. So now this is also great for a lot of the other problems that we've done in class for just simple spring mass or spring mass damper type of problems. We can plug right into this right here, build it out, simulate it, and see what the results are here compared to your hand solution. So then we'll move on to our damper block here. So we follow up there our uh, box down here for our, our details on our translational damper. And again, down here in our parameters, we have our damper and Damping coefficient here, so we label this as our C, and again, make sure we select the correct units from our drop down menu over here for our damper block. And then we can get into our Y function, our function Y dot block over here. So I call this back up right here. There's our function Y dot right there. So we can go through this here, and again, this comes from our Simulink uh, user defined functions right there in that library there. So we can click and drag that down there and build this all within Simulink there. And again, reference back to these slides as a PDF in the lectures so you can go through all the details and plug these in correctly uh, to, to practice going through this entire um, diagram. 
So then we can talk about our scope and our clock blocks right here. So the scope and clock blocks are their basic Simulink blocks. So that's where we can find those in sinks and sources libraries. So as we go back to Simulink, make sure we go to those two sections in order to grab those. Again, click and drag them, select those, put them into our workspace there. Um, we can see down here, we have our PS converter right here. We can select our units, our derivatives. Um, any, uh, if we're going to apply any conversions right down here, again, make sure our units are one of the most important parts that we need to consider with this here. Um, we can select this and place this uh, PS converter block from our Simscape utilities library. This block converts a simulant signal to a physical signal or PS. Its blocks parameters window are shown here. Uh, again, make sure we have the correct units and we select them down here, the correct drop down for whatever problem we're working on. So from there, we can talk next about this ideal translational velocity source block. So a quick overview of this, we can select and place this block from our Simscape Foundation Library, Mechanical and Mechanical Sources, and we get this uh, box that will pop up down here for us. And one thing to note is there are no block parameters for this guy here. So what we should have so far as you're going through this in Simulink here is you should have something that looks like this if you've been following the steps so far. So double check, go back again through the lecture slides and make sure you've got everything correct. Did you select the right clock? Your Y dot function, your uh, uh, Simulink PS converter, ideal translational velocity source, and then your spring mass damper up here. So this is what we've created so far and this is what yours should look like. So next, we're going to add two more blocks here. We're going to add the solver configuration block and the mechanical, mechanical translation reference block. Now, our solver configuration block comes from our Simscape utilities library, and our mechanical translational reference block is going to come from our Simscape foundation library, mechanical, under the translational elements library right there. So this one is going to provide a reference point for specifying velocity. Uh, the block parameters window is going to be shown down here, right in this guy here. Um, and what we see is there is no parameters here and it's connected into our whole diagram as we see over here. So here is our mechanical translational reference block right there and here is our solver configuration block. So this is what we should have so far. So next we can take a look at our solver configuration block. So this is going to define the solver settings uh, for this Simscape physical network. So the solver for the entire model must be set separately. So its block parameters window is shown down below here. So we can see, okay, here's our block parameters for our solver configuration. Here's the parameters right there. Um, and we can see right here, for this example, do not change any of the parameters in this block. All three boxes should be unchecked, just as we've shown in this figure over here. So we're going to add a couple more blocks now. One of the blocks that we're going to talk about adding here is our ideal translational motion sensor block right here. So this is our ideal translational motion sensor block right there. And where we can find this is in our Simscape Foundation Libraries Mechanical and Mechanical Sensors Library. And what we can see is it connects its R port to the mass block. So we come down here, here's our R port right here, and here's our mass block right there. So we can see how that connects up here within our diagram. And we'll get into some more information in, uh, in a little bit on this block. The next block we're going to place right here is our PS Simulink Converter block. So right here is our PS Simulink Converter block right here. And where this is found is in Simscape Utilities Library. And this converts the physical input signal, our PS, to a unitless Simulink output signal. Now you can see coming from our output port here of our motion sensor, this connects over here to our input of our Simulink Converter. And then the last thing that we're going to connect here is our mechanical translating reference. We can see right here to port C on our motion sensor block right there, connecting over to our mechanical translational reference. So now we'll look at the block parameter window of our ideal translational motion sensor block. And we can see this is shown right here. And what we can note in this is that there's only one parameter. So we can look down to our parameter settings right here. And the only parameter is our initial position. Uh, and then you can again, Put your values in right here, and again, make sure you do the correct units you can select from the drop-down menu over here. So in order to finish up this model, which we see below here, the next thing we need to do is select and place another clock and a user-defined function block, as we see here. So there's the clock we're going to select and place there, and our user-defined function block right here. Uh, we're going to enter the code for this function block. We're going to take a look at that on the next slide here. The last thing that we're going to add to this is the remaining two scopes the MUX, and to the workspace block as shown here. And this is going to complete the model. So we can see 
one scope, two scopes. There we have our block down here. And this is going to connect down to our final workspace right there. So for the information we entered into that function blocks right here, this is going to compute the base motion or Y of T. So here's the information we're going to enter in here. Uh, one thing to note is this block does not support any array operations.